Mm. All right, it's 12.01. We're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to today's tribe class, uh, Wednesday, March 6th. We are in the middle of our wholesaling module. Uh, this is week number three on wholesaling. Uh, the first week we talked about just some basic background information on wholesaling. Uh, in week two, we covered marketing uh, best practices and building buyers list and working with buyers. And today we are going to cover structures. And we're going to cover three basic ways to wholesale a deal and the structures and the documents you need for each of those ways. Okay. So today is a structure day, um, which is my, I love teaching structure because it's what I'm the best at. <laughs> And it's what I love doing. I mean, structuring deals is really fun. Um, when clients come in, they're like, oh, I got this deal. It's, it's kind of a seller finance, but there's some weird things. I'm like, okay, well, how are we going to how are we gonna solve this problem? How are we going to get this deal done? How are we going to do it? That's, that's where real estate, for me, becomes really, really exciting. Um, so I love seeing new kinds of deals over, you know, um, over and over again. Um, and helping people, helping clients structure. So let me get the PowerPoint set up because I do have some PowerPoint slides. I need to share screen. Share, 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 share. Screen. Doop -a -doop. Okay. Uh, I'll quickly go through some slides in case you missed the first um, class or two. Um, the first class, we we kind of went over all of this, the things you, that a wholesaler should really understand about a deal before engaging in wholesaling. Make sure I got the chat functions up there. Yeah, If anyone online has a question, put it in the chat function, not the Q&A function, the chat function, because I've got that up so I can monitor the chat. All right, so this was just the first week, just the background information on wholesaling and, and terms that uh, clients or uh, wholesalers should know. Uh, and then we talked about analyze, analyzing the deal. And when we talked, and when we, in the first week, when we talked about analyzing a wholesaling deal, it wasn't necessarily analyze the numbers. It was look at the, the structure itself, the, the property itself, the deal itself, and what kind of deal will make this property work. Right. And when you start to run numbers, you think, well, something might be a flip, something might be a rental, something might be good to wholesale, something maybe the spread isn't there to wholesale. And so you've got to figure out another way to do it that maybe it's just a listing. No, interesting. Okay. Um, uh, Zoom is transcribing everything I say. Is that a new thing for Zoom? It's right here on the bottom. Yeah, that's, yeah, I don't know. Hey, some, someone watching Zoom, because I'm not seeing it here, but I'm seeing it on my screen. Yeah, maybe, I, you know, who knows? <laughs> Everyone knows me and technology. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about the structure of a deal. Um, this is a diagram, not seen on the Zoom call. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know why I can see my 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 transcription. So here's a basic structure. So you've got a seller who has a property, right? So what you're going to do is sign a REPSI or purchase contract with the seller. So that's kind of step number one. So you find the deal, find the property, talk to the seller, negotiate terms, and sign a contract. So step number one, and that's why it's a REPSI, okay? Then um, you've got three options or three methods to pass on this contract to somebody else, okay? Hopefully you guys know um, it's a closed caption. Oh, thanks, Antonio. Um, you have to kind of know what the end result is going to be so that you can market it to your buyers appropriately, okay? So again, in that deal analysis, um, you know, is this a good for a flip? Is this good for a rental? It, are there going to be seller finance terms as part of this as well? Okay. Um, and then once you to determine what it's going to be used at a flip, or maybe it's a wholesale situation. Does everyone know what a wholesale is? Wholesaling is a word that's been used to describe picking up a property, but actually buying the property, um, doing paint and carpet, like a really simple, low budget remodel and then immediately turn around in and sell it, almost like a double close, except you do a little quick little remodel in the interim, 
Okay. Um, they're not, yeah, the, the whole, the kind of the whole goal of a wholesale deal is to literally turn around within a week or two and get it back on the market. Um, and a wholesale is like, again, like a double close. And we'll talk about double closes as well, but not right now. This is wholesaling. So we've got the purchase contract that the wholesaler and the seller sign. So those are the two parties to that purchase contract. The wholesaler then decides, okay, I, it's going to be a great rental property. We know that. So now I'm going to market this contract to a whole bunch of buyers. Okay. Um, and once I find someone who really wants this deal, then I need to assign somehow the rights under the contract that I have as the buyer to somebody else so that they can buy the house. Now, the simplest way to wholesale a deal is always by assignment of contract. It's straightforward. It's simple. Um, you don't need a lot of, you don't need any extra documents um, other than an assignment agreement, right? So no LLCs, no trust. You don't have to manipulate anything like that. And we will talk about what it means to just assign the contract. Okay, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, and that's usually my recommended way of doing it because it's the easiest, right? Always start with the easiest things you can do. Don't get complicated just to be complicated, right? If you can do it easily, do it easily. Um, the other way to do it, now, let me, actually, let me back up. So when you assign the contract, um, as we've spoken before, you need to make sure that first, the contract is assignable. You cannot assign a non-assignable contract, right? So the contract has to be assignable. We have discussed that in the state of Utah, the Utah REPSI, the state approved purchase contract in the state of Utah, um, on its face is not assignable, okay? So you cannot assign the Utah REPSI as it stands. If you want to use that contract uh, in this deal, you will need an addendum. Right? And in that addendum, it must clearly state that the buyer has the right to assign the contract. Which, And if the seller signs that addendum, now that contract is assignable, right? So you can assign it. Now, of course, when you do that, you're putting on an addendum that um, you're going to probably assign the contract. And so the sellers are going to understand that, and that's going to go into their consideration of whether or not they want to accept your offer. Um, and if there's real estate agents involved, that can cause a lot of problems. We'll get to agents as well. So we've got the assignable contract, um, and then we can assign it to a final buyer. And then at closing, who's the buyer, right? The new one. We'll call them buyer number two or the wholesale buyer, right? Not the wholesaler themselves, but somebody they pass it on to. So at the closing table will be the original seller down in the bottom corner, and then a new buyer not the wholesaler. So the wholesaler gets pulled out of the deal, right? They're no longer a party to the contract. Now, when you assign a contract, right, you know, you've got to make it clear that the contract is assignable. Now, there are many situations in which um, the either because the listing agent and the sellers don't want the contract assigned or situations where the property is a short sale, we're meaning a bank has to approve any contract. So if you make offers on a, on a house that's short sale, the bank has to approve the offers because they're going short. Um, or in REO properties. Anyone know what REO properties are, what REO stands for? REO stands for real estate owned. I don't know why, whatever. Okay. When banks foreclose on a property and nobody bids enough to make the bank happy, the bank can take the property back and the bank actually can own the house. And then when you buy it, you're buying it from the bank. The bank is literally the seller. Um, we have not seen a lot of foreclosures or short sales in the last decade because of the market here in Utah. Um, but if the market ever does turn, turn, which I think is logical <laughs> in the next year or so, maybe two years, who knows? I'm not, I have no crystal ball. Um, but if that market changes, you will start seeing more short sales come up and more REO properties come up for sale. And just be aware, in most of those situations, you will not be able to assign the contract. Because the banks, tip almost, almost every time I've seen, 
the bank will not allow an assignable contract. The banks don't want to deal with it. It's an REO property. It's a short sale. They just want to get rid of it. They want to know if the buyer's actually buying and the buyer can really buy. So then you can just Yeah. So it, so what's happened, and I had clients, you know, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we did have a lot of short sales and, and foreclosures. Um, I almost weekly clients would be like, hey, I got this, I got it under contract on this REO property. And I can't assign it. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and yeah, the, and the bank won't sign an assignment, you know, make an addendum making it assignable. I say, yeah, banks don't do that. They're like, well, how do I assign this? I'm like, well, you can't. <laughs> so you're going to, you're going to have to, you could sell the LLC that is currently the buyer. But if that LLC owns other stuff, which most, for most of my clients, they do own other properties, you don't want to sell it because it's got other assets. Um, so you have to know this in advance, right? This is why you're taking this class and you're learning that if you're submitting offers to a bank, uh, short sale, REO, or I would say even with listing agents, right? Because listing agents can cause problems as well. In fact, I am going to the DRE tomorrow with a wholesaler to talk about issues that came up in his wholesaling business. Um, yeah, so in that situation, if you can't hold it, then you'd have to double close. You have to buy it first and then turn around as the seller, sell it to somebody else. It's totally fine. But if you know this in advance, what you can then do is use a disposable LLC or a disposable trust and put that name as the buyer on the contract. And you do not now, now you do not need to make the contract assignable because you're not assigning the contract anymore. Okay. So numbers two and number three are not assignments and you do not need an assignable contract because the buyer is not going to change. An assignment means the buyer is going to change. The buyer number one is assigning to buyer number two and now buyer number two is going to buy the house. Okay. Not buyer number one. When you use an LLC or a trust and that LLC or trust is the named buyer on the purchase contract, what you're going to do then is you're going to sell the LLC or the trust to somebody else. And as the owner of that entity, they obviously then have the rights to buy the house under the contract because the entity itself is the buyer. So I can set up you know, a new LLC called you know, Property One LLC, right? And I can write Property One LLC as the buyer on my purchase contract, I can sign as the manager of that LLC. And then instead of changing the buyer, going back to the seller, making the contract assignable, I just take my membership in this LLC and I sell my membership to somebody else. And once I sell my ownership in this company to another person, that person now becomes the owner of the LLC with the rights to buy the house. And the buyer's never changed. Now, I can tell you um, within Utah and the division of real estate at this point, uh, they are creating legislation, I've told you this before, to regulate wholesalers and, and some disclosures that they have to put on their contracts. Um, and that's great. Um, I, I don't think they're going to be onerous or a problem, and I think it'll clear things up. Um, but at the same time, I think even if you use an LLC or a trust, I would absolutely, absolutely still disclose that I'm a wholesaler, I may be the final buyer, I may pass it on to somebody else, et cetera. And we'll talk about the disclosures either next week or the week after, you know, the disclosures to put in your contracts. Um, but I would still disclose, even if I were using an LLC or trust, okay? Technically, do I have to? No, because I'm not assigning the contract, right? But the division really likes disclosures. They really like honesty. They really like people telling everybody else exactly what they're doing so that everybody's clear. And I would, you know, if using LLC or trust, you can still put on there your same disclosures. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've never heard of a disposable, um, what you call it, disposable LLC. Yeah. Do you have to go through the the same process with the state articles of organization. Um, yeah. So the question is, um, I've never seen a disposable LLC. What's the process of setting up a disposable LLC? We're going to get to that. And the answer, the short answer is it, it's set up like any other LLC. So using a disposable LLC is a little bit more cumbersome 
in this transaction than a trust is. A trust is a much easier method. Um, the difference being, um, you know, when you're going, do I choose a disposable LLC to make this happen or do I use a trust to happen? The LLC route is going to first cost you at least 75, 70, 75 bucks because you've got to register that LLC with the state of Utah. So it does cost money, right? Got to register the LLC. Two, all LLCs have to have what is called a registered agent listed with the company. And typically clients, you know, people are their own registered agents unless they hire one. On a disposable LLC though, what has to happen though is you're selling that LLC to somebody else. So if you are the owner and manager of this LLC, if you're also the registered agent, that's just another thing you have to change over after you sell the LLC to make sure this new person becomes the registered agent so you have nothing to do with that LLC anymore. So the LLC route is gonna cost a little bit money. It's gonna be a little bit more cumbersome with the documentation and the things you gotta do. And we'll go those, through those step by step. Um, but the nice thing about a disposable LLC is that everybody understands what an LLC is. Nobody's confused by it. Nobody thinks it's fraud. Um, there's clear documents of a certificate of organization. It's registered with the state. You can see it right there. You can see who's involved. Um, and that's why, you know, if you work with banks, REO, short sales, um, I, I, the disposable LLC is a really, really good tool. Okay. The trust, if you decide to use the trust route, the trust doesn't cost anything once you have the forms. Um, the trust doesn't cost anything to create, um, doesn't, uh, not filed with the state. So there's no registration fee and there's no registered agent to worry about. Um, so it's an easier way to do this transaction, cheaper, um, faster. The difficulty with the trust is a lot of people don't understand them and aren't comfortable with them. I've seen banks not be comfortable with trust and not accept offers because the buyer was a trust. I've seen title companies refuse to close deals where these trusts are used. Because the trust that we're talking about, and we talked about a few weeks ago, are real estate trusts, right? They're similar to land trusts. And about 20 years ago, there was I don't know, just, it was a scuttlebutt. I don't know what else to call it. It was kind of scuttlebutt in the title industry about these trusts and that investors and buyers were using these trusts to commit fraud in some respect. It could have been fraud in bank loan fraud of, of using a straw buyer to get the loan or to purchase a house for, on behalf of somebody that was trying to hide themselves. So a lot of title companies actually got spooked by the use of trusts. And there are title companies in the state of Utah, in, U in Salt Lake City, that will not close and will not insure a transaction where a trust is the buyer or the seller. Um, it's been a couple of years, but First American Title Company in Utah is one of them. Um, multiple transactions where they were involved, um, they refuse to close the deal because they don't like land trusts. And in all three of those cases, we weren't informed until the day before closing. Mm -hmm. Now, that could really screw a lot of people. Uh, and there's liability there. I mean, these, these escrow officers who didn't you know, wait at the last second to say, oh, whoops, we can't close this, right? Um, on one of them, my client um, had a hard money loan. And his due date, it, the, because they wouldn't close it, we had to change title companies that took an extra couple of days. It ended up costing him one more point on his hard money loan because his extension and his, his deadline had run out. So it cost him thousands of dollars what this title company did. Um, and well, and, and at the end of the day, I ended up closing it. I just took the file and I closed both sides. Um, so be aware that the trust, while easier and cheaper, can create some problems with third parties who aren't comfortable with them, okay? So that's kind of the balancing act that you're gonna be doing. Um, in these three ways to wholesale. Again, assignment, super easy. We'll go through that step-by-step, step, get it done. Disposable LLC, a little more expensive, a little more paperwork, a little more hoops to jump through, but it will work every single time. No one's going to reject an LLC. We do that every day. Trust, easy, simple, cheap. 
But you may, may, and that's only may, you may find problems with a title company or lenders or somebody else that's involved. They're like, we just don't like trusts, right? They're becoming more common. More title companies are now familiar with them because the investor class, you know, us are using them so much now. But, you, uh, but I still see that, okay? All right, so now you've got that Repsy with the seller. You're under contract as the wholesaler. You've got your three options to pass that deal on to your final buyer. And the, it's the final buyer and the seller that show up at the closing table. The buyer buys the house in some respect with hard money, conventional financing, seller financing, whatever it is. And then the, then the buyer goes off and either uses it a rental property or a flip, okay? Next structure. And we'll get more, we'll talk more about the LLCs and trusts, trust me. Okay, this, I am seeing this a lot now. Um, this is a double wholesale. So there's a lot of wholesalers, that, especially newer wholesalers, that are finding that they're, they're going under contract and they can find the deal, negotiate with the seller, get it under contract, but then they don't have the buyer's list or the contacts to pass it on. And so they're struggling finding their, their buyer. So what they will then do is connect with another wholesaler who will then market the contract and try and find a new buyer. And the two wholesalers will split an assignment fee in some ratio. There's a couple of ways to structure this. Sometimes wholesaler num number one will actually assign the contract to wholesaler number two. And just for some fee, for buy whatever, $5,000, wholesaler number two, you can run with this deal and find a buyer for it. Sometimes the two wholesalers will sign a joint venture agreement for the deal. And on this, so for on this, this deal, um, if wholesaler number two finds the buyer and there's X uh, assignment fee, then, uh, then wholesaler number one and wholesaler number two will split that fee. And there's a document showing how to split up that fee. Okay. So there's, there's a couple of, those are the two ways to do that, but you know, don't shy away from that. It can get a little complicated, obviously, because you've got two wholesalers, you've got a, maybe a joint venture agreement, you're splitting fees, but it can still be done. All right, we can still structure this and still get it done. So if you find yourself as a wholesaler with a deal that you can't pass on, you can go to other wholesalers and have them try and find buyers for you. Okay. What's that? Okay. Here's another one. So we got the seller, the wholesaler, they signed a purchase contract, right? And in this case, the wholesaler will actually close. Right. So the wholesaler will close the deal. Um, this is a sort of post closing assignment as opposed to a pre closing assignment. So here the wholesaler will buy the property. They're going to need some kind of short term financing. Right. Because they're going to have to actually buy the house. Um, we talked you know, two weeks ago about simultaneous closings versus double closings. Right. A simultaneous close is illegal in the state of Utah. It is legal in other states. So if you're outside the state of Utah, you have to look up your own rules. Uh, but in the state of Utah, um, a simultaneous close is illegal. So you have to be two separate closings. And that means each closing has to completely fund and record, stand on its own before it moves on to the second transaction. So a wholesaler will come up with some kind of funding, short-term gap funding, bridge funding, purchase the property, close it. And now the property is titled in the wholesaler's LLC name which means the, the wholesaler is now the owner of the property. And, that, and the wholesaler can sign another contract, another purchase agreement, okay? This will not be an assignment addendum, right? That was this one, where the wholesaler never buys the property and the wholesaler simply assigns the contract to somebody else and needs an assignment addendum. In this one, the wholesaler's already closed and bought the property. So the, con the contract that the wholesaler now needs is an actual purchase contract, a new purchase contract with a new purchase price. And he can double close. So step number one is you can just double close it, right? Buy and turn around and sell. No problem. The wholesaler can buy it with a partner under a joint venture agreement. I've done this a couple of times recently because we've run into title companies who wouldn't allow an assignment or for some reason, the wholesaler didn't really get an assignable contract. So we could not just assign the contract. Um, and our next step was, if you know the Utah Repsy, remember your homework from our first module contract, if you really understand that document, 
Paragraph 19, I don't misquote the number, in that contract allows the buyer to buy in any entity in which the buyer has an interest. So if you use the Utah RepC, right, and you put your LLC, for example, um, as the buyer, and then you're like, well, I, I don't think I really want to buy this house. I'd rather pass it on, but it's in my LLC's name. How do I pass it on now? Because I can't sell that LLC, right? I, that does other things for me. Well, I can switch the buying entity to any other entity that I want, LLC or trust, and close in it as long as I have an interest in that new entity. That's in the Utah RepC. I am not forced to close in the named buyer on my contract, but I must have an interest in whatever entity is the buyer. So I can, I can, I can find my final buyer, okay? Let's say it's Gina. I can make Gina a co-owner of this trust with me. So I'm a 50% owner of the trust. She's a 50% owner of the trust. Since I have an interest in this trust, all I have to do is tell the title company, title company, I want to close in this trust instead of my LLC. And that's all it requires. I don't need seller's permission. I don't need anybody else's permission. I don't need the other title company's permission. The contract, the Utah Rep C itself allows me to do this. And so I close in this trust with me and Gina as the two beneficiaries because we're partners. We're going to partner on the deal. And then day after closing or even 10 minutes after closing, then I can sell my ownership in that trust completely to Gina for some fee. Now she owns 100% of the trust, which owns the property that we just bought. And she goes and does the deal. Okay. Um, I can put, I can use, I can go that route with a disposable LLC or a trust or even a joint venture agreement if I wanted to do the joint venture agreement. Although I think a trust or LLC set up specifically for this transaction um, will work. What's the cost? What's that? Cost. What's the cost? Um, well, remember, in a double close, you're going to have double closing costs. Plus, set up the LLC. yeah, I'll get that. Right. So, the, yeah, double close, you guys, your double closing costs plus the cost of whatever loan you need, your financing costs for a day or two days. So, a double close is going to be the most expensive way to do this, just is right. But it's also very clean, it's also very safe. Um, you're not wholesaling at all, so you have no wholesaling worries. You don't have to worry about the DRE, you don't have to worry about anything because you're not wholesaling the deal. Um, the DRE does not care if you turn around and sell it a day later, right? Because now you're a seller in another retail transaction, right? Mm -hmm. So the double close can be very beneficial. Um, double close is also very often used when wholesalers are making a very large assignment fee and they don't want their buyers knowing how big that fee is, okay? You cannot hide that fee if you just wholesale the deal because you have a purchase price on the contract and you've got to add your fee on top of that. So your buyer is going to know the spread. Right? They're going to they're see the settlement statement. So if you, if you want to hide that from your final buyer, you've got to buy it first. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. With your example of Gina, um, what type of, what, are you the manager and then she has zero, 1% and then once she actually pays you, then you swap her? How do you protect? Like, so the question you know, is, in the example that? of using a trust or LLC to kind of pass on after closing, how do I protect myself? Yeah, so typically we'll set up the trust or the LLC. Um, typically it's a 50-50 ownership. Yeah, not I wouldn't give her just 1%. Um, I would kind of keep it 50-50, right? That's clear partnering, right? I'm partnering with her. And you do that before you saw any money? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can do it, yeah, I can do it. Yeah. Or I can take a deposit, take my deposit from her as my buyer. So now she's got skin in the game and, and a commitment. And then I can create the documents and then I can go to closing and then, uh, and then after closing, she can buy the remaining equity that I have in my LLC or trust, and now she owns the whole thing. So say that she now owns 50%, and mm -hmm. then it's like, oh, I'm actually not gonna give you any money. Um, yeah, the question is, you know, what if she decides not to give me any money? Well, then we stay partners. Then, and I can even do it 90% me, 10% her. And then if she decides not to buy me out, I still have the deal. And I still get 90% of the profit. Now, you certainly don't want that situation. Sure. Um, and in my experience, that, that doesn't happen a lot uh -huh. because buyers want property. Buyers want deals. Right? That's how they're going to make money. And you can, and these agreements, these contracts are signed in advance. 
So we will sign an agreement, like a joint venture, some document that says, you know, on this date or by, by this date, she will buy me out for X dollars, right? So if she doesn't, she is breach, in breach of contract. I could sue her for that. Um, and that's really the, the only way to protect yourself. Be, I mean, the safest way would be to do it closing, right? Have her funds at closing come to me, but then it's going to show up on the settlement statement. It's going to look like an assignment and there's the assignment fee. Um, and that, and the reason we're doing it this way is to avoid all of that. Sure. Um, so yeah, we just, it's all contract. So we, there are contracts obligating everybody to do what they're going to do. And that's about the best we can do. Okay. Um, so double close again, most expensive, but it's really, really clean and safe to do. Um, partnering using a, an LLC trust, et cetera. So if you're going to use a trust again, um, the trust it, for members of the website, it's free. Uh, I think otherwise you can buy it for $300 or I can create it for you for a like hundred bucks, uh, on a one-time basis. So it's not expensive to get the trust documents. And then once you have those documents and you go back and you listen to the class from three weeks ago where I teach you how to fill it out, right? And you know how to fill it out, that you're done, free at that point. If you use the LLC route, you're gonna need to pay the registration fee, which is 70 bucks. Uh, you're gonna create a very simple certificate of organization and a very simple offer. It's a one page operating agreement, in fact. So it's not a fully formed LLC with, a, with an expensive, uh, operating agreement. Basically, it's a one-page uh, operating agreement. I think I sell my disposable LLCs for like probably 300 bucks or 250 bucks. I can't remember what they are because most people use trusts now. Um, we don't, I haven't used a disposable LLC in a number of years. Um, but once you get the forms, then the only cost is the $70 registration fee with the state. Okay. What is HM? Sorry. The number three is oh. HM or hard money loan assignment. Okay, this is, uh, I bring this up, what's the time? How much time? Make sure I got 33. Okay, I wanted to bring this up because this is actually a, a, another way to wholesale deal. Um, it's a mix of a double close and a simultaneous close. I have a feeling that if the Department of Insurance, and this time it would be the Department of Insurance regulating title companies, not the division of real estate. This is not a DRE thing. This is a, a title company thing. And, this, and the simultaneous closings, those are illegal by the Department of Insurance, right? They regulate title companies. Um, if, if the Department of Insurance saw this, they'd probably go, yeah, that's a simultaneous closing. It's illegal. But I have nothing, there's, we don't have any like specific rules or laws on it. But here's how this works. In a double close, right? The big problem is what? Funding, yeah. The first buyer has to come up with their own funds to buy the house, and that's expensive, right? So what this strategy, this hard money loan assignment does is the final buyer goes out and secures their funding, right? Because they're going to own the house, right? So they go to the hard money lender. They, they line that all up. They've got their hard money lender. But now the hard money lender is going to loan first, actually, to the wholesaler who's buying the house first. Then the wholesaler buys the house with buyer number two's hard money lender. And then when buyer number one sells to buyer number two, instead of buyer number two getting their own loan, a new loan to pay off the first loan, the buy, they substitute the borrower on the note. So the lender agrees to substitute buyer number, the wholesaler as the borrower for buyer, you know, the final buyer as the borrower. And now the borrower, the new buyer is the obligated party on the loan. That makes sense. There's a lot it's of like a complicated words. Um, it's not a subject to, it's just, it's it's actually a loan assumption. It's exactly what it is. It's a loan assumption. One buyer is assuming the loan for another buyer. That's not um, seller finance. It's not seller finance because it's coming from a hard money lender. So the money's coming from a lender, but instead of a lender loaning me, the wholesaler, a gap loan for 24 hours at you know $5,000, he's just going to loan me the you know, the six month term of a typical hard money loan, I buy it on day one, on day two, I sell it to buyer number two and buyer number two assumes my loan on the property. So it is kind of like a seller financing, but not because it's actually a loan assumption. The, the hard money lender is going to agree to all of this in advance. And the hard money lender will then allow the buyer number two to assume my loan. 
So it's an actual loan assumption is how it plays out. And, do you and need, it, sorry, um, that's okay. do you need specific documents um, to assume this loan or can you just like find it on the, like the MLS? Um, um, you would need a loan assumption agreement. Is that on the MLS? No. No, no, you need a lawyer for that. Or a lender, a lenders may have those forms depending on how sophisticated the lender is. Uh, but you would need, yeah, a loan assumption agreement that the bar, both borrowers, you know, one's giving up the loan, the other's taking the loan and the lender's agreeing to the swap. That's okay. basically what it is. Cool. Would the lender typically charge more fees? Good. Something like that? Yeah, the question is, is the lender going to charge more fees? I would say, oh, absolutely, yes. Um, now here's here's why I just don't I don't know what the Department of Insurance would say about this because technically the wholesaler or buyer number one is using buyer number two's money. That's what's really happening because buyer number two got the hard money loan and it's going to be going to be assumed buyer number two at the end of the day anyways, right? Technically, did I use buyer number two's money to buy the house up front? No, <laughs> the loan came in my name. That hard money loan to Jeff. I'm the borrower, I closed it, I bought the house, and then I sell it to Gina, and Gina just assumes the loan that I had on it, right? So it's not a simultaneous close, but it certainly looks like one, right? So my guess is someday somebody's gonna do this and someone's gonna complain and the Department of Insurance will take a look at it and make a decision. <laughs> you know, who would it hurt? Like who would be the most likely candidate to complain? The, uh, great question, who would complain? Because um, no one's really hurt. Um, the seller would probably be the most likely person if they found out that suddenly they, that Jeff didn't own the house. And they're like, wait, this is, because this is how wholesaling complaints go to the division, right? The sellers always are the ones that complain because they're negotiating and dealing with a certain person that they like and they trust. And they think, oh, you're going to buy my house. Thank you. I trust you. I like you. You sat at my kitchen table. I want you to buy the house. And then they get to close and they find that somebody else is buying it. That they never even spoke to or talked to, talked to. Um, and then they're then they freak out, they're scared, they think fraud went on, and they file a complaint. So it's probably going to come from the seller that finds out that suddenly someone owns the house. But at the end of the day, I did buy it, and the loan was in my name, and then I just sold it to somebody else, and they assumed my loan. So I've heard the same structure done, where the house was actually not sold. Um, so it was kind of a simultaneous close. Buyer number one, one bought it, didn't actually take title, and then they did another closing. And that's a clear simultaneous close um, because buyer number one never took title, never owned it, and then didn't turn around and sell in a separate transaction. So it needs to be recorded twice. Yes. Recorded. Yeah, so there's going to be a warranty deed recorded where I own the property. There's going to be a trust deed recorded with me as the borrower on it. That deal is going to close, fund, and, and I own the house. And I could just then at that point just keep it. Right? I can go do the flip if I wanted to. Or the next day, I sell it to somebody else and they assume my loan. Yeah, it feels really unlikely that they could find that information out. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be very, very difficult. And I don't think anyone would really ever complain. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you the Department of Insurance, just like the Department of Real Estate, has you know their set of laws, regulations. You can do this, you can't do this. And then at the very end, it says, any attempted violation of these rules is a violation of these rules. Both of them say that. And that's where they get most people, right? They're like, well, you didn't really do this, but you tried to, and it looks like you tried to. So we're getting, we're coming after you anyways. Yeah, their, their, their laws are very expansive. They're very broad. They're very vague. They literally can interpret those any way they want. So what would be the penalties and, and who's wrong? Well, in that case, it's gonna be the title company. If a title company uh, performs a simultaneous closing, then the um, title, the carbon insurance would go after the title company. Yeah, that's a title thing. So yeah, so yeah, the borrowers and the, they're they're not. There's no problem with them. It's just I did an illegal transaction. Okay. All right. <laughs> Structuring the deal. Well, we're going to start this. We won't necessarily finish this today. We'll pick it up next week. So these are the essentially the ways to do it. We can assign the contract. We can sell a trust. We can sell an LLC. We can do a double closing. So let's talk about assigning contracts. The easy way. <laughs> so 
when you assign the contract, the first thing you have to realize is the named buyer is going to change. And a lot of people think, well, no big deal. I mean, this is an assignment agreement between me and my final buyer. The seller never sees this. It's not going to be a big deal. The seller's not going to find out. Yes, the seller's going to find out if they are paying attention. <laughs> because when the seller comes in and signs closing documents, they're going to sign a settlement statement. That's the financial numbers. You know what that is, right? At the top of every settlement statement, it's going to list the name of the seller and the name of the buyer. Right. And if that's not your company name that the seller was working with, they're going to, oh, who is this? I don't know who this company is. Right. And they'll also see the warranty deed. They have the sellers have to sign a warranty deed. And on the warranty deed, it's going to have their names as the sellers. And then right below, it's going to have the name of the buyer. And if that name or that person or that LLC or trust is different than who they, than, that was on the rep C and that they sellers are negotiating with, that can cause problems because the sellers now know the person they were working with didn't buy the house, somebody else did. So what went on? That's why disclosures are really important. That's why the DRE wants disclosures. Um, sorry, I have so many questions. Here. No, so okay. I'm curious from an agent perspective and like fiduciary responsibility, like if you were the agent and saw that, would you want to be like, hey, by the way, it looks like this is wholesale or does that just freak them out for no reason? Yeah, I that? would, you know, with working with agents, um, I can tell you the single most important thing to do is to over disclose everything about what you're doing. Because if they have any inference that something is amiss, they'll just blow it up and they're going to come after you. Just going to complain. I've seen the complaints that these people write. And it actually, the complaints come from the agents of the sellers, not from the sellers themselves. And then you would say, hey, it looks like these names are yes. probably a wholesaler. Yeah, and that's, why it, um, that's why the division is creating is these regulations. So on every deal, if you're going to wholesale it, you have to disclose that you're a wholesaler and that your intention is to wholesale the deal very clearly in the rep seat. So the agent and the sellers will know that that is a possibility up front. So when they see the new buyer, and that's going to clear things up. I mean, that's going to help with all these sellers, you know, freaking out at the closing table. Once we, once those laws are in place and you have to put that on every contract, sellers are going to know, right? And I think it's a good thing. You know, I've talked to many wholesalers and some are always really scared. Like, you know, I don't want to make the assignment obvious or that I'm going to assign it obvious and make it because that's going to freak them out. Honestly, I don't think it does. I mean, I have real estate agents and brokers wholesaling all the time with a four page addendum with thousand different disclosures, right? And they're still getting the deals. So I wouldn't be so scared that sellers are going to freak out about assignment language in the contract or anything like that. I would still just over disclose, over disclose, over disclose, and then just explain what you're doing. And, and as long as you explain it well, most sellers are agreeing to this. Okay. Yeah. Why don't why don't they just take a referral fee? Why don't this do they get less if they just take a referral fee to their wholesaler? Why don't they just say, here's a deal, I'll create my spread, this is a referral, but I'm getting the referral fee. You oh. don't have to deal with all this paperwork. So the, the question is when you're you when, if you want a wholesale deal, maybe on the MLS and you're dealing with other agents, yeah, why not pass it on to another buyer and take a referral fee yeah. from the commission? Um, you could certainly do that. You could you could pass it on to another buyer, bring a buyer to the table. And negotiate some cut of the of the sell the seller's um, commission, the listing agent commission. Problem was, um, even if it's twenty five percent referral fee, you know what's a five hundred thousand dollar property at three percent, fifteen thousand, and then about three or four thousand as a split commission. Um, I would say you know so far less money. That's one reason I don't think they're doing it, but. Keep that in your 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 toolkit, though, right? Maybe you do get a deal and you find it. You, you, your contract's not assignable, but you don't want to buy it. But now you do have a buyer. Instead of trying to finagle a way to wholesale it, I would say it's probably smarter go back to the agent and say, "Hey, I've got a buyer who's agreeing to all the same terms. Um, and how about we pass on the buyer for a referral fee or something like that?" Um, At that point, you'd just be the agent, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could just be the agent and represent the buyer. And I, the, the client that I'm going in with, the, the DRE tomorrow, kind of did this. Um, he kind of did this this gray area where I saw his documents, I saw his the, the contracts, I saw his advertisements. And I'm like, so are you wholesaling or are you co-listing? 
because it kind of, I'm not really sure, you know, yes, it says, you know, you might assign it and you have the right to market the house, but he, the way he did it is if he did find a buyer, um, his contracts were not assignable. He just said, I'm, I got, he got the permission to market the house. And if he found a buyer, then he would come back and get the seller's permission to substitute the buyer through the Utah standard assignment addendum. Um, so I was like, well, so are your whole, but, but, but I, I just looked at it and I said, looking at your advertisement, it looks like a listing and it looks like you're the listing agent. And I can see why the real listing agent was a little concerned because it looks like you're listing their house at a different price. I mean, it's very, I mean, yes, you've got the disclosures in there and stuff, but it was, it wasn't a traditional wholesale deal. Like he just didn't go under contract with an assignable contract and then pass it on. Um, he just went under contract. Sometimes he bought it. Sometimes he passed it on, but if he was going to pass it on, he always went back to the seller. So he was kind of navigating this, this gray area in between like a co-listing or a split commission or representing the buyer. And sometimes he comes in and represents the buyer as an agent to get that commission. So I, what I told him, I said, that's probably the reason you're going into, into the division is because I'm not sure exactly what you're doing here, right? You've got the disclosures. I, I get it, but you should be really, really clear. And, and, have, and especially with agents of exactly your process and what it is you're doing and what it is you're not doing. Um, so I still really believe that that's going to solve most of your problems in advance simply by disclosing and having that conversation. So in Utah, is it is, is it legal to, so she mentioned like, you know, like you're acting as an agent, but you, in California, you don't have to be an agent to get a referral fee. Oh, really? Even in California, you, you, you get a referral fee without being a licensed agent? Mm -hmm. Wow. California has less loose than I'm so I know. That's, that's bizarre for California. That's <laughs> how heated that somebody brings up. Right. He will just offer a letter, and that's negotiable. And then we, he just has to submit a 1099 on them. Right. So the reason to do what he did versus just bringing a buyer is so that he can actually post pictures of the house. Yes. That's yes. Yeah. So he got the permission to post the pictures of the house and the description of the house. He got the, he got the permission to market the house. He wasn't clear as to why he was marketing it. Right. It should have said, I need the, you know, I marketed this out. I think it was, I need the pictures to market the house to potential contractors and partners. I'm like, okay, contract partners, but wholesaling is not contractors or partners. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's what he had the, the right to essentially to, to, post the pictures and stuff to, to market to contractors and partners. In his mind, partners meant other people who may buy the house, wholesalers, right? Not the clearest language. Um, so that, that was, that, that's where I think he's in trouble. I don't even know if he's going to be in trouble, but his language just wasn't clearly defining what he was doing. Can you not post other people's listings if you're clear that it's not your uh, listing? Yeah, you, well, if it's clear, if it's, if you, you can't post a listing, and you can't sell a house unless you have a listing agreement with the seller. What Sorry, you no. can do is advertise the sale of the contract, right? And with that, you can put pictures of the house and descriptions of the house, but you're selling a contract, not a house. That's the important part. On his advertisements, mm -hmm. there was nowhere prominent that said, I have an assignable contract. I'm Here's a contract that you can purchase for this price. This contract allows you to buy this house. Right. That language wasn't there at the bottom. It said, you know, all, you know, all potential buyers, you know, I think will be reviewed. Um, we may assign the contract. We may represent you the buyer. So there was language in there about what he would do in the next steps. But if you looked at the listing, it looked like a listing until the very end. Right. Most wholesalers, the very first, the biggest thing you see at the top is I have an assignable contract. To make it clear that you're not marketing the house. That's the big difference is what are you marketing? And so he had no authority to market the house as for sale. He had the right to market the contract for sale with use of the pictures and description of the house. Does that make sense? So he was, it, it looked like he wanted the permission to market the house and he, and it looked like that's what he was really doing. But what he, in his mind, what he was really doing was just getting the authority to put up pictures and Mark have maybe find a buyer. And then if he finds a buyer, then, then doing it, going back to the sellers and doing an assignment. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what he was doing. And so the, just, yeah, which it came down to the language in his contracts didn't necessarily match what he 
what he was doing in his head, like what the how he was really structuring this. Um, and I think that's really it. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, it's just kind of clear again, clarity in what you're doing. That's all the division cares about. Dude, seriously. Just tell people what you're doing. And I have never seen sellers or anybody. Now, true, if you present an offer to something on the MLS, right, and you have this contract assignable, I'm a wholesaler, I may assign it, right? That's going to be part of what is offered to the seller, what is presented to the seller. And that agent may go, hey, you've got two offers here. Here's a buyer who's going to buy it outright, just a buyer with their own agent, like a retail transaction. Here's another deal from an investor, wholesaler, who has terms that you like, but may not be the final buyer. And that may cause problems. If he doesn't find a final buyer, maybe he's going to just cancel the contract. We have to relist it. So maybe you should take this deal. And somebody with the retail buyer, not the wholesaler. That's your biggest risk. Um, not that they're going to be you know, bothered by the, the fact that you're wholesaling, but the sellers may simply take another offer that isn't assignable because it's a, a more sure deal. Yeah. Um, and the agents... Well, and the agents have a lot of sway over their sellers. Um, and if a sell and if an agent thinks that wholesaling is illegal or fraudulent, and there's a lot out there that still think that, they could replay re, uh, replay that to their sellers and and encourage your sellers not to accept your deal. So this contract that you got from the sellers, it probably allowed the sellers to continue finding other buyers, right? Um, it, not specifically. The question was, were these sellers allowed to continue with other buyers? Not necessarily. So they just like one the right, but you can always send like you can always solicit backup offers. Yeah, and and I think it's always smart as an agent, yeah, because right? you never know if a deal is going to go. I mean, financing conditions, appraisal conditions, a million reasons that are legitimate that people back out of contracts. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah, this listing can always get backup plus. You have to remember that agents are not very smart, and agents are not very experienced. Ninety percent of the agents in our state have been in business for less than two years, and have done like three deals. That's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's ginormous. The, I don't know if it's 90%, I'm throwing that number. But the vast majority, 80 to 90% of real estate agents in the state of Utah have done less than a couple of deals. They have their license because they were bored or they have family and friends that they help out on occasion. That is literally the vast majority of all the agents in the state. There's only a small handful that are true real estate professionals that's full-time jobs that this is what they do for a living. And they do a lot of deals and they really understand this business. Mm -hmm. Most agents do not. Most agents do not. Most agents, I'm sorry if the DRE is watching, but <laughs> most agents make the deals worse and cause more problems than they solve. That's my experience in 25 years of working with real estate agents in the state is most of them are woefully incompetent and inexperienced. And when somebody's inexperienced, they have a tendency to also be very arrogant and demanding and not accept that they don't know certain things. And they have to be right. And then you've got a real problem. And I've got a real problem right now that I'm working on with a client. And it's all driven by the agent. 100%. Agent has inserted herself where she doesn't need to be, where she doesn't, it doesn't have a right to be. And she's interfering with the contract. <laughs> what do I do? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so far I've not had to speak with her. Because I heard the F word comes out of her mouth every other, every other word. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, I like the questions though. These are great questions. Um, so back to assigning the contract. So the simple way to do it. Remember that the buyer's name will change and banks, REO properties, short sales and listing agents, right? Freak out if buyers are changing, right? We've had a lot of discussion on that. Novation versus assignment and liability. I do want to cover this a little bit. If you are familiar with the real estate world and you've heard Pace Morby, he has some new program that he sells called a Novation. It's not a Novation. It's a joint venture with the seller. It's kind of a variation of seller financing, right? I'm going to tell you what a true Novation is, <laughs> what a real Novation is, okay? The, there's two ways to assign the contract, right? If you have an assignable contract, and that means you have the Utah Repsy with an addendum that says the buyer has the right to assign the contract. Um, one thing, FYI, writing in the buyer line, your name of your LLC slash and or assigns, that is not sufficient to make the contract assignable. Okay, let me be very clear. Writing in and or assigns on the buyer line is not 
sufficient to make that contract assignable. You must have something in an addendum specifically granting the buyer the right to assign the contract, okay? So once you have an assignable contract, either you made the Utah reps assignable or you have a simple one pager that's gonna be assignable right off the bat. You can do the way most wholesalers do this is by way of assignment. So wholesaler signs a separate assignment agreement, so a separate contract with their final buyer in which buyer number one, the wholesaler, assigns the rights to buyer number two. In that situation, which is 95, probably 95% of all wholesale deals, in that situation, what happens if buyer number two doesn't perform? What if your final buyer can't get funding, doesn't show up at the closing table, doesn't do the deal, right? And this contract falls into breach of contract. What happens? Who's getting sued, right? Your final buyer screwed up, seller's angry, seller wants to sue somebody, who are they going to sue? This is wholesale. They're going to sue the, both the wholesaler and the final buyer. They're going to sue the final buyer first. There's going to be the first person named on the lawsuit because that's the buyer now on the contract due to the assignment agreement. So the final buyer did not close. They are liable. Your, your, your buyer is liable for not closing, 100%. However, you, the wholesaler, are still liable. You're called secondarily liable on the contract. So the seller can add you to the complaint and sue you along with your final buyer. And the seller can collect a judgment from either one of you. So you're still on the hook as a wholesaler if your final buyer doesn't perform. You, the wholesaler, are still on the hook if all you did was assign the contract to your final buyer. If you don't like that situation, you don't want to be responsible for your final buyer, then what you need to do is a novation. A novation is a true and legal substitution of somebody else into a contract that fully relieves the released party. How do you make that happen? Very easy. You get the seller to approve of your final buyer. That's all it takes. So, but most wholesalers don't want to do that. Most wholesalers don't want to go back to the seller. They don't want to tell them who it is. They just want to keep this as clean and simple and just moving forward without complications, right? So typically wholesalers only assign a contract and they are typically remain secondarily liable on the contract. If they don't want that to happen, then when they find their final buyer, they can pull out the standard Utah assignment addendum, right? The, the approved form. But you'll notice on the approved form, you, you, the first buyer, have to write in the name of your new buyer on that contract and the seller will agree to that. So you, you have to do like a number or email that. No, you need the seller's permission to remove you and put somebody else on. And when the seller approves that substitution, you are no longer liable on the contract. So it's a great way to, you know, if you, if you don't want to be liable, you got to do an ovation. But to do an ovation, you got to go back to the seller. So it's a toss up. Okay. Utah Rep C agents, a simple contract, the created by an attorney exception. Okay. Well, I think we'll just, yeah, we'll finish up with this today. We'll continue with trust analyses next week. So um, if you are a licensed agent, um, when representing somebody else, like you do in most retail transactions, you must use the Utah state approved form. Or you can use a form cr created by a lawyer hired by your buyer or your seller. So when you represent somebody as a buyer or a seller, they, your client, can hire an attorney and create their own purchase contracts. That's totally fine. And you can still represent them with the attorney's contracts. But your buyer or your seller has engaged the attorney to create the contract on their behalf. Builders do this all the time. If you walk into a builder's showroom, there's an agent always sitting there, right, selling you the houses that the builder's building, right? And if you ever bought, if you ever bought a house from a builder, they don't use the Utah approved repsy. Not even, they use their own contracts that are terrible for buyers. But those agents are allowed to fill out that form because it was created by the lawyers for the builder, which is the seller. You see how that works? Since the builder is the seller, 
the builder can hire a lawyer, create their own forms, and the agents can fill out those forms. That's how builders get away with it. Um, yeah, question. So as a broker, if I have a, I sell mobile home parks in California, I have a contract that's specific to just mobile home parks that I use on every transaction. So here in Utah, could I, could I hire you to write as a mobile the, home park specific? Yeah, so the question is here in Utah, can a broker or agent um, hire a lawyer to create a form or document to use in transactions and fill out and even have their agents fill out, for example, right? The answer is yes, you can hire a lawyer to create forms that your agents fill out as long as the state has not already created a form for that. So if the state has an approved form, you must use the state approved form. If you if there's if there's no form for what you want to do, then you can hire a lawyer and have a lawyer draft those forms. Meaning there's nothing to form, so you don't have to use the REPC, but if there's something different than the REPC states, you could no a for a purchase contract for for home or for real estate utah has an approved form they have an approved purchase contract they have an approved seller financing contract too the seller financing addendum right so those are the con things that you have to use when it gets to the addendums they're a little bit more flexible uh, because you can take anything put it onto a generic addendum you don't need to use the form it's mostly the the purchase contract um but, but utah has a purchase contract so that's the one you have to use. Um, for a mobile home, you know, if there's not something specific for mobile home, you could probably get away with creating those contracts. There's 200 in the state that probably isn't. Yeah, there, yeah, there's probably not a form for that. Um, but yeah, as long as there's no other form, then you can do it. Um, back to that, if you are a real estate agent and you're not representing somebody else, okay? Okay, so the, what I just talked about was when you are acting as a licensee representing a buyer or seller in a transaction. That's what you do as your job. Now I'm gonna switch gears and say, you who happen to be a licensee are buying homes or selling homes for yourself. This situation we call, you're acting as a principal in the transaction. You're not acting as an agent in the transaction, okay? So if you're acting as a principal in the transaction, the first that thing you need to do is talk to your broker <laughs> and ask your broker, broker, what do I do when I'm buying and selling my own homes? Do I need to run that transaction through you, the brokerage, or can I do it on the side since I'm not acting under my license? Because you're not acting under your license. You're not representing anybody, right? So you don't need, you don't have to run it through your brokerage unless your broker requires it. So your broker can set his own policies and say, yes, even when you're acting as a principal, I want you to run it through my brokerage. Or your broker would say, nah, that's fine. Go do it yourself. I don't want to be involved, <laughs> right? That's your broker decision. You've got to make sure you comply with your broker's rules. Um, then, let's see, where was I going with that? Um, oh, so you're acting as your principal. And now, since you are not acting as an agent, filling out a form for somebody else, you can use any document you want. Especially if, you, if your broker doesn't require, if, you, if your broker requires it to be run through the brokerage, then it's like any other transaction. Utah Rep C, same forms, listing agreements, whatever it is, whatever hoops you jump through for a retail transaction, you're going to have to jump through even when you're buying it yourself because your broker is going to assume that you're acting as an agent for you. So all that. But if your broker says, no, you know, just do it on your own. I don't, I don't care. Use it. You can use a simple two-page Rep C, no problem. So then, <laughs> so then the broker isn't liable for the actions of the agent. And then in that example, the broker is not liable. That's right. And some brokers don't want to be liable for the, the transactions, in which the investor transactions in which they're wholesaling. Some brokers don't even want wholesale deals run through the brokerage because they don't want the mess. Um, so yes, they, they, then, then they don't have to do it. Your question was? Um, but if you're getting a commission, say for example, you're buying a house on the MLS, so then you have to, yeah, the question was, if you want the commission, if you're buying off the MLS and you want the commission, then you have to be the agent representing yourself or your LLC as the buyer's agent. So you get the BAC. 
what if you were to, I guess it doesn't really matter because it's not that bad going through a brokerage, but right. um, say you were buying a property and then you said, you know, 3% of the purchase price to go towards closing costs. So it's not really a commission at that point, And then you just don't take it as an agent. Is that changing at all? Um, the question was, what if instead of taking uh, the 3% BAC, um, instead of as a commission, you just have a deduct off the price or contribute to closing costs or something like that. Yeah, so you can do that too. And if, if as long as you're not taking the well, like would you decide? You could probably do it either way. You could represent yourself, do it traditionally, fill out all the forms, and just say, okay, instead of my B, and just have your BAC applied to your closing costs. That's totally within your your rights to do. Um, if you wanted to use a simple contract, then I would say, then I would probably come at it unrepresented, no commission. Don't even talk about commission. It's not going to your brokerage. But you can say, hey, as an unrepresented buyer. You don't have to be a, pay a BAC. Right. Can you deduct that off the price? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now you're just saying. Now you're just like I don't. I don't know anything about agents. I'm not. I'm not representing. Just are not asking for commission. But you're gonna. Your client's gonna save some money. Can we negotiate that into a lower price or something? Mm -hmm. But you're not saying I want my commission used as because you're not getting a commission anymore. Right. Now you just say your buyer, your seller, saving the BAC. Can I apply that? Can can I get a reduced price or something? Because if you were to take three percent and put it towards your closing, wouldn't it still be tax taxable because you kind of had money given to if, you, even though you put it? In depends the on how it right depends on how it's written and depends on how the money flows. If if it's done as a commission, you receive a commission, then the commission is applied. Yeah, it'd be a commission. But if it's just if it's turned into a reduction in price Real. or seller credit, so you could okay. just say buyer. The agents take no commission. Three percent then to be deducted off the purchase price, or three percent in close. Your seller provides three percent in closing costs. Yeah, yeah. And, then yeah. Then and then you don't have that problem with the, yeah. how with how it's taxed. That is correct. Okay. All right. So yeah, and if you're, of course, if you're not a real estate agent, right, you can use the Utah Repsy. It's totally fine. I actually really like it. I I don't mind it. It's better than most states. It's not as good as some other states. Um, certainly better than California's. <laughs> um, yes, it's six pages, but it's the terms are so well known by most people, title companies, other agents, broke. I mean, it's just it's just a cleaner document to use, and it's got a lot of stuff in there. And most of my wholesalers that are agents that have to use this have no problem. So this idea that you can't get a seller to sign a six page contract, you want something simple, I don't think is even true, right? Sure, some sellers are like oh, I don't want to read. I don't want to read all this contract, right? Yeah, sure, but that's not very often. Um, like two people are expecting a longer contract, so if they're just like one page, it'd be like, what's missing? Yeah, I think you even sellers. Yeah, when a seller sees a one page, it's like, oh, is this fraud? Yeah, yeah this seems very not legitimate, right? Like this is a a napkin at a bar <laughs> that we're signing. Which, by the way, if you're not an agent. You can write terms on a napkin in a bar as long as you have what. Signatures? Signatures of both parties, price. purchase price, address, yeah, and the names of the buyers themselves, and some due date, some some end date. Okay. All right. Um, it's about 10 after. We'll stop here. We will pick up next week with trusts and disposable LLCs. Um, if we get through that quickly, then after that, we're going to be talking about issues, complications, and problems that arise in the wholesaling transaction and how to solve them. So that'll probably be the end of next week and then the week after, the five weeks. Cool. Okay, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks for taking all our questions. Oh, that's the best part.